Hello, you're listening to Corpus Cast, the show all about corpus linguistics and what it can do for society. I'm your host, Robbie Love, and I'm a lecturer in English language at Aston University. Happy New Year! It's our first episode of 2023, and it's our first birthday. Um, we started in January last year, so uh, thank you to everyone and, of course, every single guest uh, who has made our first year of Corpus Cast so much fun. And of course, thank you to everybody who's been listening um, and watching to the show. Um, in today's episode, I'll be speaking with Dr. Don Knight and Dr. Anne O'Keefe about Corpus Linguistics and online communication, um, particularly in these virtual settings that we are often in the workplace. Um, we're more connected than ever before, but are we communicating effectively Amid COVID-19 and the so-called digital pivot, online virtual communication has been placed at the heart of our daily lives, both professionally and privately. As we move into the post-COVID context, the affordances of this digital turn have shown that we can operate professionally online. But there is a need for a better understanding of what has become and is likely to remain a new way of communicating in the workplace. Now, these aren't my words, but the words of today's guests who are leading a research project using methods, including corpus linguistics, to better understand virtual communication in the workplace. Dr. Dawn Knight is reader in applied linguistics at Cardiff University. Her research interests lie in the areas of corpus linguistics, discourse analysis, and multimodality. She has expertise in developing methodological frameworks for corpus compilation, and in developing methodological approaches to the construction of minoritized language corpora. Recently, she was a principal investigator on the National Corpus of Contemporary Welsh, leading on the creation of a large-scale open-source corpus of contemporary Welsh language. And she's also a former chair of the British Association for Applied Linguistics. My other guest today, Dr. Anne O'Keefe, is Senior Lecturer in Applied Linguistics at Mary Immaculate College, where she specializes in the use of corpus linguistics to explore areas such as pragmatics, discourse analysis, learner grammar, and media discourse. She's the editor of the Routledge Applied Corpus Linguistics series and the Routledge Corpus Linguistics Guide series, as well as co-editor of the Routledge Handbook of Corpus Linguistics. She's also director of the Intervarietal Applied Corpus Studies, IVAX, Research Center, an international network of corpus researchers working in applied linguistics. Basically, both Dawn and Anne are wonderful, successful, and fantastic people in the corpus linguistics community, and it's a great pleasure to have them both on the show. So please welcome Dawn Knight and Anne O'Keefe to Corpus Cast. Hello, both. Hi, Robbie. Hi, Robbie. Hi, welcome. Thank you both for uh, agreeing to come on. Um, it's great to uh, to see you both. And I'm really uh, excited to get the chance to talk to you about your work. Um, and I, I, I hope that you um, enjoyed <laughs> that um, a rather lengthy introduction, but deservedly so, because you're both such busy people. Um, we've got so much going on. So uh, thanks again for, for coming on. Um, I want to start by asking you both um, a couple of questions that I ask uh, every guest here on Corpus Cast. Um, and Anne, we'll start with you. Um, what does Corpus Linguistics mean to you? Okay, um, thanks for the really kind introduction as well, Robbie. Um, for me, Corpus Linguistics is a really exciting way of looking at language, looking at language patterns, but doing so on a large scale and doing so empirically. So in one sense, it gives you corpus tools to do a lot of um, the, the work. Uh, the computer is going to do the counting. It's going to do the retrieving. But I suppose for me, the most exciting part of corpus linguistics is actually what happens next when you have frequency results. Where do you go? And that's the kind of sweet spot really of observation and interpretation where you have to form hypotheses, you have to compare, you have to go back to the data, you have to go back down deep into the text, you have to compare again, you have to hone the observation and the hypothesis and so on. So really it, it gives us this great opportunity to understand patterns of meaning 
in real language use. And the computer helps us do that on a large scale, but the computer doesn't do it for us. It helps us. And, and how did you get get started in this um, in this world of corpus linguistics? Has it been part of your academic life since the beginning, or is it something that uh, caught your attention a little bit later on? Well, I think nobody um, starts out saying, "I'm going to become a corpus linguist." <laughs> <laughs> Some moment that brings them there, and and very often, especially in in uh, my generation of corpus linguists you, you know when I say that I mean like the the start of the millennium where I, I was undertaking a PhD for people who started around that time there's usually a person who who brought you into corpus linguistics and for me and for many other people that was Mighty McCarthy he was external examiner at Limerick at a time when I was looking for a topic uh, for my PhD, he was talking about the CanCode project and it sounded so exciting. And through Mike, then I got to know people in Nottingham. And I guess the rest is, is history, really. That, that's how I got into corpus linguistics. Um, and the lucky thing for me is that Mike McCarthy, Ron Carter, they got into corpus linguistics because they happened to be hired by John Sinclair at Birmingham. So it's a wonderful connection. And I got to meet John Sinclair and I feel hugely honoured uh, for that. And uh, and Dawn, let me ask you the the same uh, question. What does corpus linguistics mean to you? Uh, thanks, Robbie. Just to say, happy birthday to Corpus Cast and happy New Year as well. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> um, so it's generally the same sort of um, thing. Well, answer as as Anne's given. Um, it's it's mainly about us answering interesting questions about what we say and do and kind of how we do it, but at scale. So. Um, and mentioned computers, they're kind of uh, the kind of crux of what we use, but they they, are, they don't give all the answers to everything. But we use computation, computational tools and computers to provide interesting ways to inquire about language use. So it, it offers a sort of principled and evidence based um, insight into communication within and across different contexts. And thank you. Yes, yes. Uh, I, I think there's that there are definitely themes that that I've noticed across the last year. Um, but but interestingly, some people do lean more towards the the talking about the quantitative side, and others lean more towards the really you know it's a means to an end, but it's still you know language at the heart of it and, and trying to understand language use. Um, Dawn, uh, again, same question to you. Um, tell us a little bit about your your academic journey as well. OK, for me, it's yeah, it was all about timing. I was in the right place at the right time, really. Um, connection with the University of Nottingham as well. So I was doing my um, master's in the, the mid noughties um, and there was a lot of activity in corpus linguistics going on there with people like Ronald Carter, Mike McCarthy and Svenja Adolfs as well. Um, and they started to have a major influence on the field, particularly in spoken corpus linguistics. Um, and they were very much connected to the department. So um, there was a kind of. Um, a lot of activity, as I say, in that area. So I first encountered it on an MA program. Um, Svenja was teaching a module on corpus linguistics, and I remember all the students going into the module having absolutely no idea what it meant or what we were supposed to be doing. Um, and they, there was a very early misconception that it was all about maths, all about stats. Um, but to me, it was something that was beyond that, something that was very new, very exciting, and I could quite quickly understood the potential for it, I guess. Um, obviously, with a great teacher, that, that was very helpful. Um, but I also, I did have experience with maths and further maths in my, when I was a, at school, I guess. So um, that did help a little bit, but I could see beyond the numerical aspect. Um, so from that, Svenja encouraged me to do a, a, a PhD. So I got an ESRC scholarship. Originally, I was planning to look at the sociolinguistic representation of aging um, oh. using corpus methods. And so I started doing that. Um, and within about a year, I was involved or kind of, well, well, somehow got involved on various research projects, including one that Anne was involved in. She might mention it in a minute. Um, and Svenja and Ron were um, working in, starting to work in and develop sort of approaches to multimodal corpus linguistics. So I ended up one foot in that, one foot in my PhD. So I thought to make things a bit easier, kill two birds, one stone to align them with each other so that was it was very lucky so my my I kind of shifted the focus of my my PhD I'm um, still interested in aging but went down a very different path and those that sort of work um, and getting involved in those projects 
gave me a taste of interdisciplinary, I can never say that word, interdisciplinary research um, and working with people from computer science, IT, um, psychology, and gave me a really good taste of working collaboratively on large scale projects and to see what corpus linguistics could offer beyond applied linguistics. So that kind of brought me to where I am today, but that was a long winded answer. <laughs> Now we, we we are going to touch um, in for for both of you how how some of the research you've you've done uh, between then and now is informing the work you're doing now. But I do want to kind of skip forward to the present day. Um, you are both co-principal investigators on um, a, a very big project um, funded by the AHRC, the Arts and Humanities Research Council, and the Irish Research Council called Interactional Variation online, harnessing emerging technologies in the digital humanities to analyze online discourse in different workplace contexts. Let's start with, with the big picture. First of all, congratulations on, on getting the funding for, for this, this project. Um, what sorts of interactions are you interested in in this context? Well, I guess the, the context is like this one, um, online meetings that we've become more and more used to. It's not that they didn't exist before COVID, but I guess uh, there was uh, very much a pivot, a necessary pivot. So we're looking at workplace discourse uh, in this context across uh, cultural organizations, um, business organizations, and uh, public sector organizations as well, trying to cut across the different types. And on one level, we're trying to investigate um, the discourse itself, but as Don might explain, we're also trying to move uh, more research into a multimodal space. So trying to provide enabling tools because these type of data are easy to gather in a sense because we're, you know it's easy to record a meeting. But then how can we help people to move away from just doing a transcription of a spoken text? That's another one of the, the big aims of the project. Yeah, I might pick up on that as, as well, if that's OK, Robbie. As, as you know from your own work, Robbie, that um, spoken corpus development is still pretty laborious. Um, and there's been quite a few barriers to the construction of big and useful data sets. But as Anne has explained, the digital pivot has kind of changed the way that we might be able to do things. And so one of the things that we're offering as part of the project is um, developing sort of guidelines or um, yeah, guidelines for other researchers to come along and kind of replicate what we're doing. So how might they create a multimodal data set and how might they approach the analysis of this? Um, I say quick and dirty is the sort of way we're going to approach this and some people don't like that expression, but that, that's kind of what it is to make it as accessible to any type of researcher as possible. So a lot of work on the kind of methodological side of things there. Um, so, yeah, it's kind of evolving standardised ways of doing it. Um, when I first did my PhD and all that sort of research back in Nottingham over 10 years ago, um, we kind of outlined some of the, the challenges, um, technological, methodological and practical challenges associated with this work. And some of them still exist today, but now we're in a position to be able to respond to them as well. So that's part of what we're doing as well. So it's a case of trying to better integrate transcription, which is the sort of standard approach, as you said, to, to studying uh, speech in a, in a corpus context, uh, with all of the other um, elements of this sort of interaction. Of course, it didn't really occur to me that this is um, quite meta in that we are talking about the sort of interaction you're studying using the mode of interaction that you're, you're studying. And so maybe um, uh, later on, I'll be able to sort of read some of your findings and go, ah, OK, <laughs> maybe I should do that better in this way here. Um, so, yes, I, I suppose I'm sort of skipping around some of the, the topics here. But since we're talking about multimodality, I, I want to ask about that a, a little bit more. Um, what, what, what is the sort of the, 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 the state of the art in terms of the transcription is, as I said, a, a well, you know, accepted part of studying spoken uh, corpus data, but is is the, the goal eventually to be able to essentially analyze the, the visual elements of, of spoken interaction in, in the same in the same way that you would be able to search through uh, the, the textual representations in, in corpus data? 
to, to some extent, yes, and it kind of is already possible. So we we, we learn um, quite a lot from psychology, gesture studies, and so on, um, and even quite a lot on, in um, computer science and they create digital tools for tracking gesture and things automatically. We're not doing that. We're trying to say, as an analyst and applied linguist, how would we approach these data sets? Hmm. So it's kind of um, protocols for, for sharing as well as um, approaching the data. So you might share um, methods for annotating certain head nods, but looking at function as well as form. Um, and it's, it's, yeah, and... <laughs> Yeah, I, I guess, Robbie, it's a, it's a really uh, relevant question in that, I mean, you'd love to be able to put in a search for head nod mm. and boom, all the head nods come up, but you know very well, somebody's got to actually annotate when that head nod happened as you head nod um, <laughs> while I'm talking. So, you know, we're using tools like Elan for precision here and tiering and so on. But the micro detail then that that generates, um, that does require um, a lot of qualitative analysis, uh, qualitative annotation. So, yeah, it, 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 is, it is challenging, but we still think that it's, it's really worth doing. But it does mean moving away from the notion of corpus linguistics being searching for a form and let's use the form here to be you know nonverbal as well and then generating a result and then seeing how it functions i think we need to also think about uh the opposite direction where you're looking at a function that's been described you go to this kind of data then you annotate for that function for example, right now we're looking at back channeling. So you identify all the things that are behaving as back channels. Right now you're nodding. So that would be that would be tagged then as, as a type as a back channel. And Don might say, mm, well, that's also back channel. So then once you pull out all of the back channeling, you then can look at what what forms are used to perform that function. That it's very labor intensive. So this project isn't going to result in a massive corpus. It's going to result more in protocols that will help people to do this type of analysis because we just feel for years the tools have been uh, with us to, to do more uh, multimodal research, but it's just it's just so much easier to just look at a transcript and look at it, put in a search for a form and get its frequency. So yeah, there are a lot of challenges ahead but we hope to give something uh to the field yeah for for, for those who uh, watch corpus cast on youtube i've been told that i do an awful lot of nodding um so if, if anyone were to end up uh trying to analyze this so i'd cause them a lot of uh pain because they'd have to do a lot of uh um qualitative coding of my nodding um but you're right it's it's such a it's such a big part of of the way that we're we're interacting in these these virtual contexts so i think it's it's brilliant to to develop these sorts of protocols as as you're doing um and i'll i'll, I'll stay with you because you've published a, a lot of research in in pragmatics in conversational context um that i you know sort of gather a, a mostly in, in the past have been looking at face-to-face -face situations, for instance, in higher education, university seminars, things like that. Um, the, the methodological parts aside to do with what, what we're discussing here with capturing the data and, and different ways of, of how we're searching the data, from a kind of theoretical perspective, do the, the sorts of things that we've come to know and assume about how people interact face-to-face -face, to what extent does that apply in this virtual setting? Is it more or less kind of taking those those theories and, and applying them in the same way? Or are there uh, features that the, the fact that you're not in the same room with, with somebody, what, what, what effect does that have potentially on, on the way that we reconsider how people communicate through speech? Yeah, that's a super interesting question. And I don't know the answer yet, but I I I, I, I'm certain things are, are definitely coming to us. Uh, first of all, it, it is a, a mediated and managed type of interaction. But, you know, we can say that about, uh, you know, an interview on TV or radio interview, etc. Um, it's more on record. Um, it, it 
could be recorded, etc. I do think that aspects of politeness, positive and negative politeness, that there, there are shifts there. And um, I think that um, there's greater need to minimize um, face threat. In terms of positive, positive politeness, maybe the need for solidarity might be greater and, and, and uh, avoiding disagreement, I would say, that's coming out in the work we're doing at the moment. Um, another area, probably more related to positive politeness and building solidarity is that it's really difficult to do humor in this context. And um, you can't really make a quip, a quick quip, because you you disrupt the flow because the technology then spotlights you. Uh, and, and I think that function of the technology where it spotlights the speaker also has an effect in terms of you know, you said it yourself, you would normally not nod as much. Mm. But you, you probably tend to nod because you know that even a minimal type of vocalization could bring unnecessary spotlighting to you when you, you just want to remain the listener and you don't want to grab the, tur the turn. So, um, yeah, the politeness side we're noticing as well in, in terms of negative politeness that um, yeah, greater mitigation. But on the other hand, the irony is that the person, the power role holder in a hierarchical um, workplace situation probably has more power because they are chairing and they can hold the floor for longer. And, um, you know, even, even anecdotally, you know, people say, you know, oh, you know, I had an idea at that meeting, but I didn't want to interrupt. You know, I left them talk. You know, um, so yeah, I think that we're we're noticing um, more, maybe greater mitigation on one level, but there 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 are potentially um, access issues and equity issues there, and also um, yeah, gaze is another one that that's really difficult to work with, and even the alignment with traditional uh, routines and phases of discourse, like what's an opening and what's a closing. You know, um, closings now everybody's waving, and <laughs> that's the end. You know, where does a meeting start? The pre-meeting bit, you know, uh, etc. So I'm rambling on, but a lot of things are coming to us. A lot of things seem to to be different. Um, we're currently looking at back channel behavior and that that's proving really interesting because specifically we're noticing shifts now um don we're, we're talking quite broadly at the moment about uh what's uh sort of in in the abstract are, are there any particular um types of organizations that that your as a your project is interested in working with um any sort of particular sectors i, I suppose it's sort of um through covid you know more or less every organization from every sector has had to switch to having at least some of these sorts of meetings. So uh, are there any restrictions or, or particular contexts you're, you're interested in? Um, it's a good question. Well, we put the, the initial proposal for this together during COVID. Um, I remember those very long days, Anne, um, <laughs> strapped to the computer getting this done. Um, but we, from the sort of outset, we set to recruit and engage quite a large sort of cross-section of, of different type of stakeholders really or end users um, including education sort of cultural backgrounds but also business domains um, it was quite important to us to try to include a diverse um, set of sort of backgrounds or that sort of cross-section um, of domains uh, within the design of the corpus to enable us to represent as many different contexts as possible um, it's not exhaustive as Anne said previously we're not set to create a, a huge corpus here it's more of a kind of case study approach but we think these domains represent a good cross-section and they allow us to get some quite good and um, representative sort of um, pictures about online communication. We've also got, well, I'll give you some specific sort of examples. We've got um, estate agents, theatre, um, publishing houses, city of literature, a city council, um, communications company and some representatives from the public sector as well. Um, we've also gathered some data from political context, but it's a bit of an outlier. It works in a very different way, but some interesting questions have come up from that. So we might start to look at business discourse compared to political discourse and so on. And, and presumably participation is, is quite easy for, for, for these organisations because they just simply have to send you the recording of the meetings that they're having anyway, right? 
Absolutely. It, we still encounter the sort of ethical um, challenges that I'm sure that you've encountered in the past, collecting the spoken discourse. Um, and the fact that p people are seen, people are visible. Um, it, in the past, when um, I've worked on previous projects, people have been quite opposed to kind of giving up the digital image because the, because the, you know, the vis visibility of things. But because of the shift in COVID, we're quite used to it. So it it's just part of daily life so yeah they are more more open to offering this sort of data to us particularly now well particularly as they they understand that we're not trying to to use it in a um, damaging way um it's just to help their own understanding so the stakeholders on the project are all set to benefit in different ways so for them they get to understand how how best to communicate in these contexts how do they work in ways that allows everyone to engage with the conversation to speak and it's you know um, looking at the barriers, but also the carriers. What works well? And and I think um, it would be it would be interesting to ask both of you that this actually because uh, you know when you're working with these stakeholders who are not um, involved in academic research, typically um, linguistic research, corpus linguistics, uh, even less so. Um, when you come to sort of a, approach a, a potential. Um, stakeholder, a, a non-academic partner, as you have done with with several organisations on this project. To what extent do you sort of try to explain the the specifics of the methods? For instance, corpus linguistics. Um, do you do you sort of bother trying to sort of get them to to kind of understand what you're doing with the data, or is it much more like we're going to analyse it? And when you know, we don't need to. We don't need to worry about the specifics. Do you sort of try and explain exactly what you're doing, or do you do you feel that that might sort of potentially put them off if they they get too much detail of what you're going to do to the data? Maybe maybe Anne, you want you want to start? Yeah, um, I think we desperately try not to scare them off. Yeah. <laughs> First fear is that you are interested in the content of what we're saying. You know that you're going to, like analyzing detail, the content. Uh, and I think it, it really reassures people when you say, we're really interested in how you communicate more than what you say. And that's usually a big calmer. And um, I think we don't get too technical. And once we explain, um, you know, what we're interested in, in terms of how meetings start and how uh, the, the speaker changes and how it might, um, you know, how they, they might deal with uh, conflict or humour. I think they, everybody gets that. Um, and I think Dawn had a lot of experience in this um, going outside of academia um, when she was involved in, in, in uh, Corkank, and that's really helped us as well. And I think you're right; just getting too technical doesn't necessarily help. It's more about reassurance that um, this is about looking at, at interaction and communication. Yeah, I think that's 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 an interesting word, reassurance, and and something I've encountered in my work um, a couple of times is potential participants perhaps wondering if we're evaluating their language use, you know, the the, the fear that we're going to yeah. take, go away for a few months and come back and say, here's all the things that you're doing wrong. And and that is, is that some, is that a sort of fear that, that you might have encountered with, with some of your participants as well? I can come in on that and actually I, I, I give some examples as well that Anne mentioned there. Um, I don't think we've kind of encountered that really. It really is, um, from the start, sort of thinking about stakeholders and their sort of engagement, it's really important when you're putting your research questions together and you're thinking about what specific interesting things are we trying to answer here. Um, and method aside, it's about the problem. Mm -hmm. um, and being able to articulate the problem to anybody, so that includes the person who's reading the funding application, but that's the general public and those stakeholders is the important thing. Um, that's nothing about corpus linguistics necessarily. So the, the, that's the end bit, isn't it? So it's remembering our roots as applied linguists. So it's the application of the method rather than the corpus itself. Um, so hopefully that answered your question. I completely forgot what the question was, but I'll talk a bit more about um, the example that Anne um, suggested on, on core cake. So with core cake, it was slightly different because the end product was um, essentially the data set. 
Um, mm. From that, there were there's different ways, obviously, that people can use the data set. So in education for um, lexicographers and and the government and so on. But trying to articulate in the first place what a corpus was was very tricky because it's very abstract. And it took us about three years of legwork to well, just demonstrating those applications again. So there's this thing that allows you to do these things. So it's yeah, it was. Um, it was that was a very kind of um, it was a steep learning curve, but a very important one. Um, and now I've changed. If, if it's okay to, to keep waffling on, there's um, we've I've changed the approach slightly with another project that we're we're doing um, an HRC funding project called Free Text, which is a free text analysis toolkit for um, English but also Welsh. That's so a bilingual toolkit. And what we're using there is essentially some of the things we built um, from Corkin, so part of speech taggers, semantic taggers, and so on for Welsh. But repackaging packing, packaging them in a way that makes them useful and meaningful to anybody. So creating a sort of intuitive way of people um, kind of approaching a toolkit, but enabling them to analyze. So, you know, when you've got survey data, there's always that question at the end where you can put your free text responses. People typically sit there, you might have a highlighted pen or try to do some content analysis. They're quite tricky to, to work with, aren't they? So we're creating a system where people can basically chuck in their text and get some sort of meaningful analysis. Those analyses are basically some of the corpus tools that we're used to, but we never mention that it's a corpus. We never mention that these are corpus techniques. We just make the process of um, interrogating the text meaningful and useful. Um, so for that, it's all about education. So it's teaching people the benefits of corpus-based methods without even mentioning the word. So we don't have to badge it as that, even though it kind of is. Yeah, yeah, the sort of distinction between how how we as academics talk about our work and how we repackage that to the the public audiences. Um, you mentioned Corkenk there, of course, that this big national uh, contemporary corpus of, of Welsh that 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 you you led on on the development of uh, Dawn. Um, obviously, you, this is a a, a different context uh, now with with the Ivo project, but I suppose from you know jumping from leading one big uh uh in, into institutional multidisciplinary project to another one now co co pi with with uh with Anne on on this project is there anything so what the, you said the lessons that you learned you know from from Kolkenk, um what have you taken with you from from that project into into the Ivo project now yeah, that's a good question. So the, well, the most important thing um, for any of these projects is relationships. Um, so being able to work with others um, and being able to also to respect each other. It sounds really obvious, but um, you need to kind of find mutually achievable goals that everybody understands. And to understand also that when you're sat in a room with um, with Cool Cake, there's a team of 30 people there from different sort of disciplines. Um, so from education, from the software engineers, um, Welsh language experts, and so on, um, but also stakeholders. So again, people like the government, um, education providers, all sat in the same space. Um, they have to be sat there for a reason, but also have space to talk and um, to all benefit in the same sort of way. Um, so it's about respecting everybody's strengths and their abilities and drawing on them all to create something um, useful i guess but something that works um in cork we had the dream team and this is definitely dream team point two um and Anne will possibly say why <laughs> yeah yeah i i wanted to ask you uh Anne, um from from your perspective what what does the the process look like of um putting together such a large uh diverse group of researchers for instance from these various universities the research team um, advisory team, but then of course all the the stakeholders and beneficiaries as well. Uh, what's the sort of time scale? You know, from 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 the germ of the idea to sending off your your funding application. What are we are we talking weeks, months, years? I mean, how, can you share any sort of insight from how did that look from your perspective? You know, people ask us that question, and that was actually the easiest part, and the reason was. Uh, because of the IVAX uh, network that you mentioned at the beginning. Um, Dawn approached me, uh, Dawn approached uh, Svenja. Svenja, Dawn and I are already very connected through IVAX and we have been for years. Um, I thought, well, 
uh, Fionn Farr uh, here in Limerick, and that was an email. And then uh, Sandrine uh, Moraldi in a UCD, who brought in a colleague, Ben Cowan, and uh, Svenja had former PhD um, link with um, uh, Swansea. And for me, former, my former PhD student, based in Aberdeen and honestly it came together in a matter of days but that's because there were there there were there was just years of networked connections we were immediately uh, able to draw on that and, and for a lot of projects that's the difficult bit trying to pick the people but that that really wasn't in our case and, and I feel very fortunate for that and I suppose it's a vindication of having all those years of, of networking uh, engagements through the research center. Tell us a bit more about, about IVAX. Um, I, I did, yeah, I mentioned it at the beginning, obviously you, you lead this, this center and network. Um, tell us a bit, a bit, a bit more about that. Yeah. Um, I hope the um, vice president research is not for watching this, but um, like 20 years ago, he put out an email saying there's funding available for an um, establishment of research centres. And at that time, you know, corpus linguistics um, in our institution, you know, we think of who's, who'd heard of it. And and I was the only person doing it. But I decided I'll, I'll create a research centre and I'll give it a name. And, um, and I'll also, it'll allow me to formalize the connections that I have with Nottingham, with Belfast, with the, the other college within uh, Limerick at the university. And so um, I just set it up out of a, a really strong need to have uh, a tribe. Um, and so that's, that's how it grew. So through Mike, I had connections with Nottingham and Svenja and Ron. And then ultimately, uh, within a few years, um, I met Dawn. Uh, and, and, and that's the, the same with all the other connections that they led to other connections and that, you know, doctoral students then go off and they get a post in another institution that grows the, the network. So, um, it it's been a fantastic um i guess yeah it's it's it, it's created a family especially in the early days when when a lot of people will relate to this in corpus linguistics you often find yourself the only one or part of a really small minority in a department and yet when you team up in a network or a research center it really makes you feel um like you're part of a community I've been lucky enough to to attend, I think, three or four of the the IVAX uh, conferences in recent years, and I certainly uh, see that it is very much a, a, a thriving community. So I'm I'm looking forward to uh, the next conference, uh, whenever and wherever that may be. Um, so uh, I, I I I'm aware, obviously, that the the IVO project is in progress, um, and I think it's running uh, until 2024 or, or thereabouts. So um, clearly, you know, I wouldn't expect you to be in a position to go. Here's what we've found, and here's, you know, the the. But are there are there any kind of initial um, initial findings that you you are able to share at this stage? Yeah, well, I guess um, it's pre-review stage, but we we're currently working on um, back channeling behavior, and that's just really interesting. What we did was, as I mentioned, um, we took a function to form approach. So we were able to quantify uh, the amount of head nods that were functioning as back channels in, in listenership behavior, plus the different forms that were being used in back channeling. And we had already conducted research uh, on Irish English and British English using can code and the Limerick Corpus of Irish English. So we had we had baseline data and obviously others have looked at it as well. So we were able to see maybe some changes in terms of forms and patterns, but also in terms of the nonverbal behavior, Dawn's PhD work and, and developments from that also gave us a baseline um, in, in, in institutional settings. So it's proving really interesting. Um, Dunn Dun will, will share as well on this, but just some, some initial observations. Um, 
head nods, as I mentioned, are playing a really important role in listenership. And in casual conversation, the most frequent type of listenership behavior is to give continuer, uh, to use continuers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and so on. But interestingly, people are holding back on giving continuers. And the, the most frequent type of back channel in terms of function is the convergence marker. And I think that's because I'm holding the floor right now. You don't need to tell me, keep talking, because I'm keeping talking here. Uh, <laughs> so I think people, 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 if anything, don't want to kind of encourage the continuer function. But convergence um, seems to be important. And maybe that's tying in with positive politeness. But also convergence maybe is expediting uh, the end of the, 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 the a, a kind of a turn, a transition. If I see of you nodding, I'm I'm also maybe conscious that I can wind down what I'm saying right now, which is what I'm doing. <laughs> that's that's really, really interesting. Don, did you did you want to jump in there as well? Yeah, and some of the other patterns we also we've also seen is um in, particularly in the work I did on the, the institutional data, so that was supervisory data. Um, the, there was a kind of general tendency to have co-occurrence of spoken and non-verbal back-channeling forms. So those can, the ones with the continuum function, so the most minimal, um, there was a tendency for, for the use of like, yeah, with a, or mm, with a small nod, for example. And that seems to have gone. So we seem to be doing one or the other, but it's quite infrequent, the co-occurrence of these. And that's because obviously, when you they they do tend to co-occur, it might be a bit of a move to take the turn because it pops up, doesn't it? So when Anne was talking about the window, it highlights that you might want to say something. So it's it's a bit of an imposition. So it's it's changed that sort of um, dynamic. And yeah, so there's there's some interesting patterns that we start to see. But as Anne says, we've only just really started on the, the kind of the nuts and bolts of the analysis. But we're hoping to extend it in different ways. So Anne mentioned maybe some stuff about gaze direction. So some stuff about the emblematic use of gestures. So emblems are those sorts of um, gestures which have very clear sort of meanings. Um, so um, like a thumbs up, for example, face-to-face -face communication, they're quite infrequent. We don't really use them. They tend to be different forms of gestures completely. But in this sort of environment, they have a different role. So we might be examining those. Things about proxemics as well. So your position and your um, orientation to other people online. These are things of, you know, emblems are quite easy, but looking at days, gaze direction, so on, is, is very tricky because it's very difficult to know where people are looking um, and whether they're looking at other people, what their screens look like. So the screen setup for this right now is probably going to be consistent, but when you've got Teams or Zoom, you get to choose how, how you interact with the, the system. So that brings up loads of challenges. So as we mentioned at the very start, um, part of the project is to create sort of guidelines for good practice, but it's also to articulate these challenges to say, if you embark on these sorts of things, think about these these um, these practical and uh, methodological considerations and challenges. Well, I very much look forward to, to seeing um, the, the, the research that emerges uh, from the project over the next couple of years. Uh, we are going to start to to wrap things up now. You may be relieved uh, to, to hear um, you, you've survived uh, the Corpus Cast experience. But before I let you both go, um, I do have my quick questions. Um, in the interest of time, I'm not going to um, force you both to answer all three questions. Um, my first quick question I'm going to pose to Anne, if I may, um, and that is, uh, what is or are the biggest changes you've noticed in Corpus research throughout your career? Um, I guess the size of Corpora, you just have to, for example, go into Sketch Engine and you'll see 500 different Corpora across uh, 90 plus languages, and that's a fantastic change. The speed at which we can analyze these corpora and the amount of that we can store as well. And they're all interlinked and very much linked with cloud computing. And then what's wonderful to see is that uh, corpus linguistics uh, as a means to, uh, in itself, to look at language has grown, but corpus linguistics in terms of being able to look at language in society and language use um, across, across uh, professional communications, critical discourse, language learning, et cetera. 
and that's that's just grown so much as well brilliant thank you okay dawn uh the the, the hot seat uh switches to you for my second question um what is the biggest misconception of corpus linguistics that you've encountered i'm going to mention two um, one that I kind of mentioned at the start, that it's all about maths and stats, that you need to have kind of that sort of quant experience um, and to be a programmer, actually. They help, but they're not necessarily essential. And the other one is the only route to generate frequencies is through form first. We don't think so. Um, we can function to form is a, is a valid way of doing things, but we need to adapt and develop our approaches to analysis of function in corpora, particularly with corpus pragmatics. Okay, uh, I will ask this final question to, to both of you. So I'll stay with, with you, Dawn, uh, to begin with. Um, in your opinion, how will corpus linguistics um, make an impact on the world in the future? Uh, difficult to predict, um, but I guess they will continue to be ubiquitous. More people use them and validate methods and criti critically reflect on language use, I guess. So it's um, hopefully... Um, to enhance or create critical perspectives on how language is used in the public domain, in social media, political discourse, and so on. And Anne? Can I just say what she said? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, it, it, it's hard to, to crystal ball, it really. Um, and who knows in terms of computing where things are going, but maybe we won't use the term corpus linguistics, but we'll just naturally, as we would Google something, that we can validate and, and look at, at language use critically uh, in, a, in a much more automatic um, way through the availability now of tools. And I guess an important point in that is the need for open access, I guess, as well. Um, so yeah, um, I'm optimistic, really optimistic about the future, um, because you know, especially because corpora now are available not just in English, but you know, across different languages, and that's really exciting. Well, I'll have to have you both back on Corpus Cast in maybe thirty years' time, and and we can <laughs> we can look and see whether your your predictions were were accurate or not. Um, I we will bring things to to a close here. Thank you so much, both. Uh, Dawn and Anne for, for joining us for the episode and of course thank you to our listeners um, and viewers uh, however you've accessed us whether that's on YouTube or Spotify or Google Podcasts or Podcast Addict or even Podchaser um, why not subscribe and chuck us a good old five star review while you're at it and of course do let us know your thoughts um, about this and other episodes using the hashtag CorpusCast um, and you can follow uh, our research group on Twitter at Aston Corpus, and you can follow me um, on Twitter at Lover Mob. Um, Corpus Cast is an Aston Originals podcast written and hosted by me, Robbie Love, and produced by Sam Cook. Thanks again for listening, and thank you to our guests, Dawn Knight and Anno Keep. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you, Robbie. Thanks, Robbie.